25 years ago, southern New England was hit by one of the most powerful snowstorms in our history. Hello, I'm Weather Team 10 meteorologist John Giorsi. Tonight we look back at the blizzard of 78 as we rebroadcast this Channel 10 special storm of the century. It's been five years since we first aired this program. We'll give you an update on the key players at the conclusion of the show. Right now, sit back and enjoy this incredible story of courage and cooperation. Storm of the century, the blizzard of 78. The winter of 1978 had begun with a series of storms that swept across the country, causing death and misery for thousands of Americans. On the west coast, these storms took the form of massive rainstorms, causing floods and mudslides. On the east coast, snow and ice storms tied up traffic, closed schools, and taxed the resources of cities and towns. There was no doubt in anyone's mind this was going to be a tough New England winter. But the forces of nature were conspiring to make things even worse. Cold air in place, storm coming up from the south, and another storm weaker at that coming in from the west. When all those converge right along the east coast of the United States, you have the potential for what we call in meteorology a bomb. Storms like that are called once-in-a-century storms. Despite what many people recall, there was some warning that a serious snowstorm was headed our way. As I was driving into work, I could hear the, uh, the meteorologist on the radio uh, talking about the storm in words I had normally not heard before. They were saying it was going to be an explosive storm. In fact, two storms coming together over the East Coast. It began with a few flakes falling from the sky about 11 in the morning, but by mid-afternoon, the snow started to fall at the rate of three to four inches per hour. Soon the wind would be blowing at 35 miles per hour. Schools and businesses began to close. Suddenly, hundreds of people were trying to reach the highways. I moved about maybe a quarter of a mile. How far you have to go? Greenville. About 11 miles. You gonna get there? I hope so. Governor Gary he spent more than two hours trying to drive from Newport to the State House and found himself temporarily stranded at Providence College. By the way, the students carried me out of the building, by the way. They lifted me up on their hands and carried me out of the building. I mean, they were having a lot of fun in this blizzard. The governor declared a state of emergency, mobilizing the Rhode Island National Guard. Assistant Adjunct General John Kiley was in command. We knew early in the morning, I'd say around 11 o'clock, we had a major problem. And we started to alert our people in. Traffic was grinding to a halt, the snow still falling at a frightening rate. And then, of course, the situation got worse. Uh, we had that, uh, we had a truck jackknife on, uh, on 95 right at the bridge. And uh, that blocked up 95, and then things just disappeared. With no way out of the city, thousands found themselves stranded in Providence. They couldn't have, 95 was unavailable for travel, so where were they going to go? So they had to stay here. We couldn't plow the streets because there were so many cars here. And as a result, the place was, uh, you were locked in. The responsibility for coordinating the state's response to the storm was the duty of the Office of Civil Preparedness. Director Santo Amato, recovering from triple bypass surgery, suddenly found himself at the center of the storm. Well, I can truthfully say at 5 o'clock that afternoon, the way things were coming in, the calls that were coming in, three and 400 an hour, uh, I went into my office and said, what do I do now? I thought I knew everything, and I knew nothing as far as the amount of snow that we had out there. Television began to play a vital role in the unfolding drama. Channel 10 had parked its remote location truck at the State House. Uh, you have to understand that in those days, uh, WJAR was the first television station to have that live capability. One of the questions raised by the media was whether state highway workers who were involved in a contract dispute at the time of the storm had staged a work slowdown that contributed to the disaster. That's negative. We, we went through that time and time again, even afterwards, and nobody could actually show that as to be a fact. We had a serious snowstorm 
the big factor that caused the, uh, the breakdowns on uh, 95 were people that weren't familiar with driving in the stuff, uh, and they abandoned their vehicles when they shouldn't have. As night fell across southern New England, the blizzard continued to rage. There were increasing fears that people might be trapped in their cars. The authorities had to consider the possibility that some of these unfortunate victims might even freeze to death. One of our, our major concerns was there were thousands of cars, of course, stuck on the highways. And uh, we wanted to make sure that there was nobody that was staying in their cars overnight. The National Guard began the difficult task of going from car to car, asking any occupants to leave their vehicles and seek shelter. Remarkably, this had to be done by request and not by direct order. It was persuasion. We, uh, we were not operating under martial law. We, you know, this is a state of emergency in the state. And uh, they had to be encouraged. And they had to be convinced that they were in danger. Once they knew that this was a serious thing, and they, they weren't going to get help right away, then they finally get to go. My forecast that night brought no comfort, continued snow, high winds, and heavy drifting. The storm had become what some were calling a snow hurricane, and there was no relief in sight. Storm of the century, blizzard of 78, will continue in a moment. We have a genuine snow emergency reaching all the way from Washington, D.C. to north of Boston this morning. The eastern seaboard of this country is practically paralyzed by heavy snows that struck during the night and are continuing, especially in the New England region. Day two of the blizzard, snow is continuing to fall, but at a much slower rate. A Channel 10 photographer bravely boarded a helicopter and returned with the first aerial footage of the disaster. The images were mind-numbing. An estimated 30,000 cars stranded on the highways. The thing that is uh, unbelievable right now is that we are told by civil defense officials, as uh, you've been told, Bill, is that there are still probably 1,000 people in their cars on the highways, and they have been there since uh, by 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Once again, concern over the safety of stranded motorists intensified. Uh, finally, Colonel Stone got troopers walking all the way down 146 and 95, uh, trying to determine if these people were still uh, alive, let's put it that way. Despite the severity of the situation, Governor J. Joseph Garrahee continued to display a calm sense of purpose during frequent live broadcasts from the basement of the State House. Those constant reassurances from the governor's office became a lifeline for thousands of viewers. We were on the air, uh, and uh, the big question was is who had power to watch us, but uh, electricity was not the great problem, as I remember it, uh, at the time of the blizzard, as it was in, in times of hurricanes in the past, so that most of the state was marooned indoors watching Tim. Uh, most of our regular programming was interrupted, if not completely uh, eliminated, while we put on uh, local coverage of the, uh, from the State House and from news that had come into our newsroom uh, in the downtown location. For a second day in a row, with little time for sleep, the task of reporting directly from the crisis center fell on the shoulders of Jack Kavanaugh. I knew I was in an emergency situation, and I knew that the best way for people to get through an emergency situation was to be able to take information that I could provide and then let them use that information the, the best that they could. You don't have to hype a story like that. Uh, you don't have to uh, infl in inflame something like that. It uh, is a major, uh, major event that takes place, and it speaks for itself. Also at the command center, a young reporter for a local radio station. It was kind of a jovial setting at first. We were all kind of goofing on it. Uh, and then uh, as we realized that uh, we weren't going anywhere and the body odor uh, quotient was started to go up, uh, it wasn't really funny anymore. And uh, we were eating sea rations army sea rations that uh, someone found in one of the rooms down there in the basement and I remember the big treat was to try to get your hands on the spaghetti and meatball sea ration because when you heated that up at least it was edible. With schools and businesses closed and traffic at a standstill it seemed as if time itself had somehow frozen but life and death continued. We got a call from the, the first one I think was the saddest was someone who had someone die in the house and we couldn't get it. They couldn't get anyone up there, and they couldn't get to us. And we had to tell them to, you know, put the body in one room, turn off the heat in the room, 
and open the window. But just as a natural cycle of death could not be halted by the blizzard, neither could the cycle of life. Ever since their wedding, Jimmy and Susan D'Amico had wanted a child, but they never dreamed the baby would arrive in the middle of a blizzard. She came out of the bathroom, I was having coffee, and she says, uh, guess what? I said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, I said. Oh, she yeah. She says, yeah. And the doctor kept telling him, you can deliver, but she's going to need to be stitched. You can't do that. You know, you've got to get her out of that house. There was no choice but to face the storm and somehow reach a hospital. We went across the street, the woman across the street, and we bowed her toboggan. And, uh, <laughs> pulled me. We put Susan on a toboggan, and we pulled her up Adams Street. Along the way, they met two men, total strangers, who offered them a ride. I thought the Jeep ride alone would deliver the baby because it was so bumpy. Remember that? Yeah, and all kinds of chains that I was sitting on saying, if I ever deliver in this truck. They finally arrived at St. Joseph's Hospital in North Providence, a facility that hadn't provided for childbirth in 20 years. Some of us had never seen a delivery, and it was, it was wonderful to see, and I kind of stood next to James to kind of give him a little bit of confidence and all that. And at one time, I think he was going to go down because he was a little nervous about it. Despite the swirling snow that had brought so much fear and sorrow, a child was born. Susan D'Amico had given birth to a son. Just everybody was in awe that this baby was born, and it was just a wonderful thing. Hospital personnel did their best to provide for the new arrival. They had to put him in um, a, laundry a laundry basket on hot water bottles because they didn't have anything mm -hmm. for babies. We did everything we possibly could to make the baby as comfortable as possible, and everything seemed to work out. It was unbelievable. As darkness enveloped the frozen landscape for a second time and the snow continued to fall, an eerie silence settled across the region. It was like a, a science fiction movie that, you know, this is the day the Earth stood still. And it was like that. Everything was just frozen at a standstill. Thousands found themselves spending another night in stores, church basements, or other makeshift shelters. With the state's resources now stretched to the limits, the governor sought assistance from the federal government. Senator John Chafee requisitioned Army troops and equipment, but a runway at the airport in Warwick would have to be cleared. I get the idea that they're a little reluctant to send the troops up in the air before they're sure that there's going to be an airport open to receive them. If the federal people would call me directly and let me know that they've got people ready to come into Rhode Island, we'll have the airstrip ready. For two long days, the people of the state had been under siege by the forces of nature. Now they were preparing to fight back. Storm of the Century, Blizzard of 78, will continue after these messages. By the third day, it had finally stopped snowing. As promised, a runway had been cleared, allowing troops and equipment to land in Rhode Island. Soon, hundreds of soldiers and tons of equipment were being unloaded and sent to battle the snow. It was an amazing sight to see these large aircraft coming in with bulldozers and trucks and troops uh, coming into Rhode Island. So it was, uh, it was really a very interesting time. At last, fortune seemed to be smiling on the victims of the blizzard. But with new resources arriving and patients wearing thin, Arguments arose over how to distribute precious snow removal equipment. Vincent Buddy Cianci Jr., mayor of Providence, charged that for political reasons his city was not being given the help it needed. You know, the truth is the truth. I don't have any animosity, but I think the people, you know, I, I don't think we should revise history <laughs> uh, with a nice show saying everybody did a great job. I don't think they all did a great job, not in my city. The accusation of playing politics with emergency snow removal equipment brought an uncommon display of temper from the governor. We're going to give Providence all the help that we can. Every other community is calling me. Every other mayor wants equipment. Providence does have a serious problem. We recognize that. And we're going to do everything that we can to help them out. The accusation that for political reasons, Governor Gary, he or members of his staff conspired to withhold desperately needed equipment was never substantiated. 
No, I think there are going to be people who will always look for political conspiracies because it's fun to do that. But I think in an emergency this big, you can't plan. A, you can't plan a, a disaster this size. You certainly can't plan a conspiracy for a disaster that size. Amid scattered reports of looting, Mayor Cianci placed a curfew on downtown Providence. Traffic in this area will be restricted to owners of businesses and other essential personnel who are properly identified as such. Progress in clearing streets and highways was being made, but it seemed to be painfully slow. The governor continued to reassure citizens that the situation was improving. I knew we were in a crisis, and I knew that I had to convey to the people of the state of Rhode Island that things were going to be okay, and that we were working diligently to get things done. And, and I tried to convey, I think, on a regular basis through, uh, uh, through television that tomorrow things are going to be better, and uh, when tomorrow got here, we're going to make it even better the next day. <laughs> the calm and composed manner displayed by the governor throughout the crisis may seem almost too nice to be true. But according to those present at the time, that was just his way of doing things. In a situation like that, you can't hide your emotions. Yeah, I'm Joe Gara, he was Mr. Cool. The, the worst thing you could have had up there was some nut screaming at the top of his lungs that, oh God, you know, the world's coming apart and it's, you know, gloom and doom. And he wasn't like that, and that was really good. He was the one thing I think people focused on and kept a lot of people going emotionally through this whole thing. Driving was still almost impossible, but thanks to some good luck or divine intervention, a helicopter was able to land at the State House. Uh, the Lord took care of us there also. That section in the, uh, at the Francis Street door, the wind blew everything right out of there, and every helicopter that landed, landed right in that one spot. Flying above the massive drifts and snowbanks, the governor looked down at the icy enemy that still held his state hostage. Well, everything was still. I mean, it was really something. I mean, the state was completely covered uh, by snow. As you know, we had three, four feet in some areas of snow. I mean, it was kind of a, almost an eerie sight to be up over and, and to see not a thing moving. The conclusion of Storm of the Century, Blizzard of 78, when we return. The Blizzard of 78 dropped snow ranging from nearly two and one half feet in Warwick to a reported four and a half feet in Lincoln. An estimated $30 million in wages were lost. Thanks to the heroic efforts of rescue workers, there were no confirmed cases of anyone freezing to death in their cars. But 21 people did die from causes attributed to the storm. It took nearly a week for the state to slowly, painfully recover. Gradually, the roads were cleared and traffic began to flow again. Schools and businesses reopened. The rhythm of life returned to our cities and towns. In time, the stock image of thousands of cars stranded on the highways faded. Other images, like Governor Garrahee wearing a plaid shirt for days on end, became part of our folklore and a target for cynics. Only one story after the blizzard that did kind of bother me that uh, uh, it was some reporter, I think, had written a story, and they thought that someone had contrived the idea of me wearing a plaid shirt, that it was some kind of a public relations thing to do that. I, said, I couldn't believe that, you know, we didn't have time even to think of what we were gonna, I just happened to put this shirt on when I was coming to the state house, you know? <laughs> During that thing, nothing was a stunt. Uh, it really wasn't. I mean, he was there because, I mean, he was going outside. He was, I think he was taking some drives around, if I recall, with the National Guard people to assess the situation. And the proper attire was anything like that. It was not a stunt at all. A few psychological scars from the storm remain to this day. Headlines like these seem to compel some Rhode Islanders to rush to the store every time snow is in the forecast. But better preparation by officials and more accurate forecasting seem to have lessened the fear of such a catastrophe repeating itself. Technologically, 20 years later, um, the main advantages that we have now are that our computer models are better. Uh, the two-day forecast today on the computer model is probably as accurate as the one-day forecast was back in 1978. For many of those who lived through the blizzard of 78, it was both a challenge and a time when people worked together to help each other. It was satisfying for me as governor to, to see the way the people responded, to see the kind of help that we received, and I mean, the help we got from the military, the volunteers, civilian defense, I mean, all these things that we we prepare for when we have an emergency, they all worked. 
what I learned during the blizzard was to take as much verified information and move that out as quickly as possible and people at home will be able to react and make their own decisions without making any qualifications or any speculation. I've learned my lessons from it, I know that. And now we, uh, I think we kind of overreact in the city to snow now. I know that I do. So that's what that snowstorm or that blizzard did to me. For many young people, the blizzard of 78 is just another interesting page in the state's history. And for some, helping people out is just part of their job. Of course, it's just a little different for Jimmy D'Amico Jr. You see, he's the young man who was born right in the middle of the storm of the century. The blizzard of 78 is now part of our history. Here's an update on the people we interviewed for this program some five years ago. I'm John Giorsi. Thanks for watching.